effective ministry in the 21st century. And as we continue to work our way through the book of 2 Corinthians, if you've not already gotten around to reading 2 Corinthians, I would encourage you to take the time this weekend to do so. You might even use a little bit of the extra time you have tomorrow uh, to make that reading. Uh, and maybe you're like me, sometimes all your tuits are square rather than round. You've got to get around to it to be able to get that done. So if you haven't already read it, read it. If you have read it, read it again. I'm sorry, that was very little humor. <laughs> Somebody once said that was a little humor, very little. But I do want to talk about what is effective or successful ministry, and I think this is a subject that's very appropriate for our church because there are many people today who have the idea that successful ministry has to involve the latest technology, has to involve satellite distribution, it has to involve online presence. It has to involve using all of these great technology things, internet evangelism and so on. Or it has to use the latest consumer-oriented methods. We have to be able to survey people, find out what do they want, and, and have our church services geared accordingly. Or for many people, it's the numbers that you have. How many baptisms? How many conversions? How many attendees on an average Sunday? And as a result, out of that has grown the idea of mega churches. And it's not just an idea. There are mega churches now here in Dallas on almost every third corner. And uh, sometimes you'll see, and I was driving through the neighborhood the other day, and there's a branch of one mega church here. There's a branch of another mega church here. And they continue to spread out. And I am in no way condemning or judging this, okay? Uh, Kathy and I have attended mega churches in a couple of different communities, and uh, we're thankful for those churches. In fact, we attended one mega church here in Dallas before it was really up to mega church size. It was just kind of a, uh, an aspiring. It had started with 35 people in a bait house. It had grown to about 1,000 when we were there, and uh, we got to know the pastor and a lot of the deacons and other people, and then the church exploded and grew after we left. And maybe that was part of why it grew was after we left. You never can tell. But the point I want to make today is that Paul is going to outline for us the things that constitute effective ministry. And it does not include the latest technology. Now, Paul didn't have a website. Paul was not on Facebook. He did not uh, use Twitter, unlike some modern-day politicians and other leaders. Paul didn't use any of the technology. Uh, he, did, he might have had he lived in our day and time, but he might not have. He also did, wasn't into the latest consumer-oriented methods. He didn't say to the church in Corinth, now what you guys need to do is survey the people in Corinth. They were pagans and idolaters, and they wouldn't have had a clue as to what church was all about. He didn't say you need to figure out a way to really make it consumer friendly or seeker sensitive or any of the other buzzwords that are used. And certainly Paul, while there had been great growth when the early church started, they had 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost, 5,000 saved after that. Paul and, and Barnabas were involved in Antioch where the church grew and multiplied significantly in at least three different stages. But Paul never put numbers or statistics down as what's effective ministry. But I think what Paul is going to talk about in terms of effective ministry are basically five essential ingredients in this passage of Scripture. Now, Paul's going to talk a lot about ministry here, and I want you to think about the situation that Paul faced back in the first century when he wrote this letter, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> Paul had been to Corinth, He'd written 1 Corinthians to them, and he basically wrote for 1 Corinthians as kind of a stern letter. If you've read 1 Corinthians, you know that Paul didn't pull any punches in that letter. Uh, there was divisiveness, there was immorality in the church, there were divisions in the church, uh, there were people that were involved in things that didn't work well financially. There were people abusing the Lord's Supper. One of the reasons we always turn to 1 Corinthians 11 when we take the Lord's Supper is that Paul was addressing how do you take the Lord's Supper and he warned them they, because they, they had a, a feast. Now we're going to have a feast Wednesday night. It's a, 
fellowship feast and you're all invited and it's a great time. But it wasn't the kind of thing they were doing uh, in Corinth. I mean, some of them were getting drunk. Can you imagine getting drunk in church at, at a communion service and a love feast? Some of them were doing that. Uh, they were engaging in massive gluttony and uh, the sort of thing that was not a good testimony. And of course, there was a lot of division and, and a lot of other things I could go into. Well, Paul wrote that letter, and then later he found out that there were people that were criticizing his ministry, and there was a situation where there was a man there uh, who was living in sin with his stepmother. Uh, if you can imagine, that kind of gross immorality was going on. And Paul wrote to tell them that they needed to deal with that situation. Uh, he said, instead of dealing with it, you are proud of it. You said, we're broad-minded. We can accept almost any kind of thing. And Paul said, that's not the way things ought to be. So uh, the church in Corinth, some of the people there were really upset with Paul. And so they attacked him in his ministry. They said, well, you know, you're, you, you can't be trusted in ministry. Uh, you know, you're, you're not very good in ministry. You're not a very good preacher. Paul was probably a better writer than he was a preacher. Uh, he, he was not very imposing in stature. Anybody remember what the name Paul means? It actually means little. And he was probably a rather small man. So he's not an imposing figure. He's not a, an intimidating kind of person. Although sometimes he could speak very straightforwardly. And so what happened is he was criticized about his ministry. And one of the things he was criticized about was Paul had let them know he was planning to come and see them. Now he'd been to see them one time in which he addressed this issue and he said it was a very painful visit. You ever have a painful visit? We heard this morning in our uh, joys and prayer concerns, Russell shared about a very joyful visit that they had in celebrating Arvita's birthday. They had family members come in and uh, certainly there we've all had joyful visits. But Paul, when he went back to Corinth the second time, he went back to address this moral or immoral situation. And he did so, and it was painful for him, and it was painful for them. And out of that, there were people there that really got upset with Paul, and they wrote back, and, and Paul had said, I'm coming back to you. And then his plans changed. And uh, while he wasn't able to go back to them as he had said, uh, and he said, I don't want to come back and have another painful visit. I want to come back when things are better and we can rejoice together. But they said, well, Paul, we can't trust you. We, you don't keep your word. Uh, you're a lightweight in ministry and all of those kinds of things. By the way, aren't you glad that preachers are never criticized in our day and time? <laughs> On the other hand, I have personal experience with the fact that preachers have been criticized in our day and time. Thankfully, it hasn't been here, but there have been places where, and, and I know pastors right now, where the pastors are on somebody's blacklist, or maybe several people's blacklist in the church. It's just not a good situation. But Paul's going to spell out in this passage, what is effective ministry? And I think it can encourage us as a church, because I see some of these things in our lives. It can also motivate us as a church to do effective ministry and to continue doing what God has given us to do. Now, what are the implications for ministry today? If you're following in your outline, you'll see some of these things there. If you're not following in your outline, then it'll be on the sticky side of your mind and you'll be able to remember it. Notice Paul goes back in verse uh, 12. And remember, he talked about encouragement in verses 1 through 11. In fact, he mentioned encouragement ten different times in there. And there he talked about the source of encouragement is God. Uh, and he talked about the need for encouragement. He was in a situation in Asia Minor where he didn't think he'd survive. We despaired of life. And we had the sentence of death uh, to motivate us to trust in God who raises people from the dead. And he said, you also help together with us. So they provided encouragement, they provided prayer, they provided financial gifts to support him. Then he moves into this whole thing of ministry. What is ministry to be like in Paul's day and even in our day? First of all, it is to be permeated with integrity. Paul doesn't start with methods, 
He doesn't start with the message even, although we might have expected that. He says in verse 12, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity. That's the opposite of duplicity. You all know what duplicity is? Yeah, I'm sure you do. Simplicity. Duplicity is when you've been ripped off by a car repair place or somebody selling something or whatever. This is simplicity. And, and the word itself, simplicity, actually had the idea of tested by the sun. Now back in Paul's day and time, they sold a lot of pottery. And people would go down to the marketplace and they'd buy pottery. And sometimes they'd sell you a piece of pottery that had fallen apart or cracked or had a big crack in it. And they'd put some glue or something on there to hold it together. And you'd get it and you'd take it home and about the second or third time you'd put some oil or some beverage or something in it. It would crack. It would fall apart. And you'd say, boy, I've been ripped off again. Now, some of you have had that happen with modern day things. Well, what Paul is saying here is, we conducted our ministry in a way that you could hold it up to the sunshine like they hold up those pots to the sunlight and make sure there were no cracks in it. There were no issues in it. <clears throat> there were no places where somebody had come along and glued it back together. One of the modern examples I think about is an automobile odometer. Now, I know that uh, some people tell you today that there's no way they can roll back an odometer. But for decades and decades, I've heard stories about cars that where they roll back the odometer, the car maybe had 150,000 miles on it, and they rolled it back to 49.5. Or maybe a car was, uh, was located down in Houston about this time last year. You know what happened in Houston about this time last year? Had a little hurricane called Harvey and almost everything was underwater. And uh, the result of that was they took some cars and they shipped them all to Dallas and Fort Worth and place, other places. They cleaned them up, they dried them out, and they sold them to people. And people buy those nice licking used cars and pretty soon they start having all kinds of major trouble. What Paul is saying is we don't conduct ministry that way. Our ministry is permeated with integrity. Now, sometimes people in ministry don't carry out integrity. I remember growing up, we lived next door to a man who worked for the railroad. It was a different railroad than my dad worked for, but uh, they become good friends and we got to know them. And uh, we had started attending a church where I'd come to Christ and my dad and my mother had come to Christ. And we invited our friends next door to church. And I'll never forget what the man next door said. He said, does so-and-so attend that church? Yes. Well, I have no intention of ever darkening the door of that church. I found out that what had happened is my friend was trying, our next door neighbor was trying to buy a piece of land. And uh, this individual who happened to be one of the leaders, what I think was a deacon, in that church had ripped this guy off. And while he was a very public person in terms of ministering <clears throat> in that church, he was not a person of integrity, and that did great harm to the ministry. I also remember going down to South Louisiana years ago and uh, speaking in a youth conference there, <clears throat> coming back home to Alabama where Kathy and I live, and telling her I don't ever want to be a pastor in South Louisiana because they had had two major failures, pastors. One of them had left with money. One had left with a woman, not his wife. And the result was churches were in chaos. Now, several years later, God led us, God has a sense of humor. God led us to pastor in South Louisiana. Even after I'd said, Lord, you can lead me anywhere but down there. But the bottom line I'm trying to get across is ministry needs to be permeated with integrity. It needs to be saturated with integrity. My friend Warren Wiersbe was with Back to the Bible many years, wrote a book called The Integrity Crisis, in which he talked about this very thing. Simplicity and godly sincerity. You see that word in verse 12? That's another term that has the idea of being held up to the sunlight, being tested in a way that shows 
the reality, the authenticity of the ministry. And he says, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. And then in verse 13, he says, in our behavior, verse 12, we practiced integrity. Verse 13, he said, in our writing, we practiced integrity. Some of them were saying, oh, Paul, you wrote these letters to the church and they can't really tell what you mean. They need to kind of read between the lines. And Paul says, no, what you read or understand, what you see is what you get, is how we might paraphrase it. And he said, you've understood us. And verse 14, you are our boast in the Lord. In other words, Paul says, if you look at your own lives, if you look at the way uh, you have come to Christ and the way you have grown, we are a demonstration of the integrity and the reality of your ministry. And the point by application that I would make is that we need to be people of integrity. We need to be people who basically our yes is yes and our no is no. And that's another issue that they get into because Paul said, I wasn't able to come to you on this journey. I made the decision not to. But he said, you accuse me of saying yes and then saying no and, and not being fickle, or being fickle, not being consistent. But he says in verse 18, as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. He said, we were committed to being open with you even when our plans had changed. And that brings me to the second thing that Paul tells us about ministry in the 21st century or ministry in the first century. Not only was it to be permeated with integrity, it was to be aligned with the Word. Notice what he says in verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silas, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him I'm in to the glory of God through us. What Paul is saying is, we practiced integrity because that's the message that we get from the Bible, from the person of Jesus, and remember, Jesus looked his bitterest enemies in the eye in John 8, 46 and said, which of you can convict me of one single sin? And the answer was they couldn't. He had lived a life of perfection. Now, none of us, including people in ministry, are perfect, okay? You need to understand it. Very important. Uh, you've not had perfect pastors in the past. You don't have a perfect interim pastor in the present. You can ask my wife if you're not sure about that. You can ask my kids, or will you ever have a perfect pastor, no matter who he is or where he comes from? The bottom line is none of us is perfect, but we are to live lives of integrity, and we are to live lives that are aligned with the Word of God, and our message is to be aligned with the Word of God. It is vitally important that whatever we preach, whatever we teach, that it communicate God's Word and it communicate the living Word, Jesus. Notice that's where Paul starts in verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Now back in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul is instructing them about their divisions. They had four different, you might call them political parties in the church in Corinth. Some were saying, I'm a Paul. He's our guy. Others were saying, I'm of Apollos. He's a smooth-talking, great preacher, orator. Some were saying, I'm of Peter. He's the rock. He's the original uh, rock on which the church was to be built. And then there were the fourth group. They said, we're of Christ. You guys are all less spiritual than we are because we're following Christ. And Paul says, look, I determined, this is 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Our message focuses on the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the reasons that we embrace the name Wiley First Christian Church. The word Christian means that we represent Christ. It means that we follow Christ. It means that we're committed to Christ. And that's what Paul is saying to this church. He's saying that Christ is our focus. Our message is Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, proved that he died. He rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. 
and he was seen by eyewitnesses, proof that he was raised from the dead. Our gospel message is wrapped up in Jesus Christ, and it is aligned with the Word of God. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him I'm in to the glory of God through us. In other words, every part of Scripture is trustworthy. Every part of Scripture is valid. Every part of Scripture is to be accepted and embraced. And we can say amen to every part of Scripture. Now, you don't say amen to something you don't agree with or don't believe in. I saw a few people saying amen after Jim sang the solo earlier today. And uh, I whispered amen under my breath. I didn't want to be too loud with it. But uh, when you agree with something, you say amen. And that's what Paul is saying here. We are to say amen. We are to agree with every part of Scripture. It's not up to us to arbitrarily choose. Now, I know organizations and denominations and groups that pick and choose. They believe this part of Scripture, but they don't accept this part. They say this part is maybe out of date. This part is okay. Uh, that's not valid. We are to be committed to biblical truth, aligned with the Word of God and effective ministry. And our day, as in Paul's day, was to be that way. That brings me to the third element of effective ministry. It is not only to be permeated with integrity and to be aligned with the Scripture, it is to be empowered by the Spirit of God. Notice he goes on to say in verse 22, he said, uh, verse 21, He's already said the promises of God we can trust. Verse 21, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us as God, who has also sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And what Paul is doing here is tying his own ministry back into the power of the Spirit of God. And he mentions four specific things. It's interesting this word for empowered. It is a big term that people love today. In fact, in business and organizations and motivation, people talk about empowerment and being empowered. But this is the original empowerment. It was by God for those involved in serving Him. And it was through His Spirit. I need to pause and remind you of something very important about ministry today. Ministry does not just mean the guy that stands behind the pulpit and preaches the scripture. Ministry does not just mean the people that serve you communion. It doesn't just mean the people that make announcements or read scripture or whatever. Ministry is something that simply is service to God and to people. And guess what percentage of Christians are to be involved in that kind of ministry? 100%. Every single one of you say, well, I've not been ordained as a deacon. I've not been ordained as an elder. I'm not a deaconess. But the reality is, you still are involved in serving God. <clears throat> you remember the time that Jesus said, the person that delivers a cup of cold water will in no way lose his reward. I'll give you an example. This happened to me last week, but it could very well have happened to any of you. How many of you at least once every month or so go get your hair cut or done? Let me see your hands. Yeah, it's like a Baptist business meeting. It's almost unanimous. <laughs> and those of you who don't, uh, maybe you want to sign up and get it done. <laughs> so I went to the barber, um, and I walked in, and my barber came up. She's a lady that's done my hair for a long time. And she's done Kathy. She's the lady that I requested prayer for this morning, Alex. And... Uh, I could tell that there was something that she was distraught about. And instead of taking me back to get my hair cut, as she usually does, she sat down in the chair next to me, and she began to tell me about what had happened the past week. On Monday, her father, who had had cancer, had unexpectedly died. And so there I was in a situation, and you could be in this situation as well, where I could be of encouragement and ministry to her on the spot. I didn't have to say, you know, let me get somebody who's a clergyman to come see you. I didn't have to say, I need to, uh, to be able to get you into a church building so you can be ministered to. Uh, those things are okay. But the bottom line is, 
All of us face situations like that where we can be an encouragement, where we can be a ministry to people, and the Holy Spirit has empowered us. And that's what he's saying here. He first of all says, <coughs> God established us. And that word established is the idea of a business guarantee. In fact, that word was used in first century literature when there was a transaction, a piece of property was sold, or a, an item was sold, and there was a guarantee along with that sale. We sometimes call those warranties today. You buy a car, you want to know, does it have a warranty? Does it have 10 years and 100,000 miles on the powertrain? Does it have two years and 24,000 miles on everything else? What does it have? You want to know. And that word here indicates that God guarantees that he's going to empower us for ministry. So this week, if you go to the barber shop or the beauty shop, and the person that's going to cut your hair or do your hair comes out and says, I've been through a terrible time, what are you going to do? You're going to say, well, I wish I could help you, but I'll have to call Pastor Don. No. You're in a position where God has empowered and will empower you to be of help to that person. Maybe you go to work and you discover that one of your colleagues at work <coughs> is going through a very difficult time. You can be of service to that person. You can be of help to that person. Not only has God guaranteed us, He has anointed us. And if you go back and take the time, and we won't go into all the details today, but in the Old Testament, when people were anointed, it was for service to God. Kings were anointed, prophets were anointed, priests were anointed. Now you go back and you look and you'll see that King David was anointed. You'll see that prophets were anointed. Uh, Elijah and Elisha give an example of that. And priests were anointed. Uh, Eli had been anointed, Samuel. Uh, so the reality is anointing in the Old Testament foreshadowed what God has done with His Holy Spirit. He has anointed us to empower us for service. And then he goes on to say He has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. You are indwelt by the Spirit of God. Romans 8 9 says that every single believer has the Spirit of God living within him. Now, if we don't obey God, if we don't listen to the Spirit, if we don't walk by the Word and walk by the Spirit, we grieve the Spirit. You know, we make Him unhappy. But He lives within us. And one of the major reasons is to empower us to serve God, to share the Gospel, to communicate God's Word, to be an encouragement, or as Jesus said, to deliver a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. Okay, ministry, for God's sake, that's successful, permeated with integrity, aligned with the Scripture, empowered by the Spirit. Fourth thing is characterized by cooperation. Look down in verse 4, 24 rather. They had accused Paul of being a real dominating kind of person. And I know that in ministry there have been preachers who've been real dominating and tyrannical in their ministry. Paul says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but as fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. Paul says, we're in this together. We're serving God together. We all have the privilege of serving Him. It is a team situation. I was watching my favorite football team play uh, last night. They did fairly well. They won 51 to 14. Hopefully we'll continue in their number one ranking. Uh, but one of the things that struck me is the fact that that it is a team sport. There's not just one person, and this will be true of your team, this will be true of anybody's favorite team. Uh, Dallas Cowboys is true of them, is true of any sport, that it is a cooperative situation. It is not a single superstar who brings about the victory. In fact, it's very interesting that this past year in basketball, uh, the team that won the basketball game uh, was the, gold, uh, the championship was the Golden State Warriors who had a large number of people who learned to play together. Uh, they were going up against uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers who had one major superstar who was probably the best player in the league, maybe the best player of all time, 
uh, LeBron James, and, uh, and yet the team was able to get the victory over the individual. And that's what Paul's saying is true in ministry here, is that ministry is a cooperative effort. Ministry involves people working together. And when ministry involves people working together, it's going to please God. It's going to get the job done. It's characterized by cooperation. We are teammates with each other and with the Lord through the power of His Spirit. 